When Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022, few could have imagined how long the war would continue or how significant the wider geopolitical earthquake would be, especially for nearby countries that have long lived in Russia's shadow. Georgia, at the eastern end of the Black Sea, is one of those still reeling from the seismic shock. We are in a very sensitive situation here. We are bordering Russia. Uh, we uh, did not know what to expect. It has a complex relationship with its giant neighbor, not least because of the ambiguous connections between its current government and the Kremlin. Almost every day, Russians are kidnapping our citizens. But it has been one of the few destinations open for Russians opposed to the war. Tens of thousands have crossed the border since February, an inflow that dramatically increased in September when Russia's Vladimir Putin announced the mobilization of extra troops. The exodus hasn't been universally welcomed. Every day, hundreds and thousands of Russian citizens cross our border. And the uh, Georgian government, which very clearly and openly collaborates and cooperates with, with the Russian government and the Russian FSB, does nothing to respond to the threats. In Georgia's bustling capital, Tbilisi, you are now just as likely to hear Russian being spoken as Georgian. And some here are worried that Putin's supporters could have been deliberately concealed among the most recent arrivals. Russians whose ethnicity the Kremlin could exploit if it ever wanted to repeat a Ukraine-style invasion here. I think there is a lot of tension here because they think that people who are running from Russia, they are just bringing uh, their problems here. It's nighttime in the capital, and the graffiti artists have come out in force. It's sixth time we are writing the same message against the Russian invasion in Georgia because our government did nothing. Russians come here now, they're occupiers, and Putin might come. It's taken an hour to finish the graffiti, but it may not be there for long. The authorities diligently paint over any anti-Russian slogans. Sure enough, the following day it's gone. But there's plenty of other graffiti in Tbilisi. First annexed by Russia in the 19th century and then subjected to 70 years of rule by the Soviet Union, Georgia shares a troubled past with its powerful neighbor. Our independence was crushed and our elites were decimated uh, or corrupted by Soviet Stalinist uh, a brutal and cynical rule, and we are paying the price for that until now. Tbilisi's Occupation Museum catalogues those seven terrible decades under the communists. To this day, two Russian-backed separatist regions of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, are still occupied by Russian troops. In a process known as borderization, the Russians are frequently accused of seeking to extend their influence ever deeper by illicitly moving the border fence further south. Georgian activists are outraged. Uh, we are monitoring the occupation line almost every day. Uh, so we decided uh, not to trust our government because our government, unfortunately, is very much pro-Russian. David Kastarava and his colleagues regularly fly drones to gather evidence of Russian incursions. It's dangerous work. They tell us that every week, Georgians are abducted by Russian soldiers and taken back into the occupied territories. Roman Begaluzi says he's been captured and beaten on more than one occasion. <laughs> Activists claim the authorities do little to stop these kidnappings because their current government favors the Kremlin. That view was given substance last February, when after Russia attacked Ukraine, 
Georgia's Prime Minister, Iraqi Garabashvili, refused to condemn the invasion and instead said Ukraine was being punished. At best, uh, their position has been ambiguous, and at worst, they have been like a you know, silent ally of Putin. And they have uh, capitalized on the tragedy of war in the most, I would say, treacherous way. Many Georgians allege the true architect of their government's apparent pro-Russian position is the country's richest man, the oligarch Bidzina Ivanishvili. He controls everything. All the institutions and prime ministers are his errand boys by his own admission. So this is uh, Irakli Garibashvili. He is the prime minister of uh, Georgia. He worked uh, for Ivanishvili. Then we have the Minister of Interior of Georgia. He was previously the personal bodyguard of Mr. Ivanishvili. And then we have um, the head of the um, State Security Service of Georgia. He also worked for Mr. Ivanishvili. Es Kurana, Kadaikza, Bidinevanishvili's Corporation. Ivanishvili's fortune is believed to now be equivalent to a third of Georgia's GDP. He's not just number one. There is very big gap be between him and whoever is number two. His home, a sleek glass castle with a priceless art collection and a massive shark pool, is perched on a mountain overlooking the capital, like something from a James Bond movie. From this vantage point, his critics say the billionaire wields almost unlimited influence. He controls all levers of power, including uh, those uh, that uh, political parties should not control, like courts, for instance, or local government. Georgian Dream, the party Ivanishvili formed to oust former pro-Western president Mikhail Saakashvili, swept to power in 2012. The oligarch himself held the post of prime minister until 2013, when he stepped down but remained a force behind the scenes and briefly held the position of party chairman. In a rare interview, after leaving office, he made this revealing admission. His critics allege this influence even encompasses the jailing of rivals. Former President Mikhail Saakashvili after being forced into exile overseas, was tried in absentia, arrested on his return to Georgia in 2021, and is now in prison on charges of abuse of power during his term in office. But supporters say they are trumped up, and Amnesty International calls his incarceration an act of political revenge. His imprisonment is a fundamental problem too, because as our own Prime Minister, Mr. Harbashuli said, if he wouldn't be politically active, we wouldn't have arrested him. That said, the oligarch who ousted him also has his supporters. Ivanishvili, they say, is now really just a philanthropist who exercises little real authority. The perception is uh, because uh, on and off he has been prime minister and leader of the party. At some point he announced about his re re retirement but then came back. Um, but um, as a member of the party, I have not seen much of his interference. We wanted to ask Ivanishvili directly about claims of his far-reaching hold on Georgian politics and his stance on Russia, but all our efforts to contact him were unsuccessful. Nevertheless, the perception of undue influence remains, and years of protests have done little to stop the party he founded tightening its grip over public life and political debate. Georgian Dream's opponents now routinely accuse it of purging senior figures in the fields of culture and science who show any signs of independence. The figures that Ivanishvili considers dangerous, they have a very good chance of getting to prison. Last May, a judge sentenced Niko Varamia, the owner of the main opposition TV channel, to three and a half years in prison. He is very outspoken and uh, personally attacked Ivanishvili, and uh, probably Ivanishvili had enough of that. Amnesty International and Georgian uh, human rights organizations say it's bogus charges. But even apparently modest scrutiny of Ivanishvili appears to run into problems. 
That, at least, was the experience of filmmaker Salome Jashi when she tried to show her film Taming the Garden in Georgia. So the film is about a hobby of the richest and the most wealthy person here in this country. And his hobby is to collect uh, century-old large trees. So he has uh, commissioned his men to uproot these trees and to bring them to his private garden through the, through the Black Sea. Her multi-award winning film has been screened in cinemas throughout Europe, North America and Asia, scores of countries, but strangely not in Georgia. After half a year of uh, consideration, the cinemas uh, refused to, to release the film here under the pretense that they don't have practice of releasing documentaries. At a cost of millions, the ancient trees were replanted here in Ivanishvili's massive Black Sea estate, a corner of which is sometimes open to the public. 48 species of exotic birds have also been brought here, many kept under a vast net to stop them flying off. He has basically some kind of private zoo. He has penguins and sharks and uh, giraffes. When we flew our camera drone over his estate, its GPS was targeted, and within minutes, security guards found us and deleted the files. The few pictures we were able to gather show a rare glimpse of Ivanishvili's lavish Black Sea dacha. Like anyone, he's entitled to privacy. But frequently in Georgia, we heard complaints that the secretive oligarch and his party are out of touch and routinely misjudge the public mood, particularly when it comes to the country's relations with Russia. We had lots of huge demonstrations. Almost everybody who opposes Ivanishvili thinks that he's pro-Russian and kind of does Putin's bidding. Protests against the oligarch and the government turned critical in June 2019, when crowds gathered in front of the parliament building after Sergei Gavrilov, a Communist Party member of the Russian Duma, sat in a chair reserved by protocol for the Speaker of the House. Though ostensibly in Georgia to attend an international gathering of orthodox religions, his appearance in parliament seemed unduly provocative. The symbolism of that was very important, that Gavrilov, uh, who is uh, kind of a very imperialistically minded Russian, was sitting in the chair of uh, Speaker of Georgian Parliament. It, he was seated there by Georgian government. So it was some kind of graphic confirmation that they want some Russian to sit in the driver's seat. And uh, that uh, caused this very emotional reaction. Thousands gathered outside Parliament to show their disapproval. But in the evening, despite the protest being peaceful, tear gas and rubber bullets were deployed. Dozens were badly injured and hundreds arrested. Gavrilov's apparent interest in the Orthodox Church is something that both Vladimir Putin and Bidzina Ivanishvili share. The oligarch, seen here with the Patriarch of Georgia, has formed a close relationship with the Orthodox Church, even paying for the construction of the country's biggest cathedral. But critics say it's a symbiotic relationship. He has taken on board the worst part of church, which unfortunately is the majority of it, uh, as its ideological ally, to demonize West, to demonize opponents, to demonize idea of liberty as such, and to use their, their hostile mob crowds as his foot soldiers. In recent years, both the government and the church have intensified attacks on what they call decadent liberalism, as personified by former president Saakashvili, who remains confined in a prison hospital, supposedly being treated for a heart condition. Those now deemed moral enemies of Ivanishvili and the church say they feel increasingly threatened, especially the country's LGBTQI community. The 
they've been mobilizing the most violent um, anti-LGBTQI protests. The biggest problem of uh, the current church is they are very much linked to Russian Orthodox Church. Last year's scheduled Pride March in the capital, Tbilisi, was thus bound to be a tense affair. The Patriarch's call for a counter-demonstration was echoed by the Prime Minister, Irakli Karabashvili, who described the event as unacceptable to Georgian society. The government actually fueled the whole thing and they gave the green light to their right-wing groups. The Pride March was eventually cancelled, but the counter-demonstration still went ahead and quickly turned violent, leaving hundreds injured. Cameraman Lexo Laskarova was just one of 60 journalists attacked that day, beaten so violently he died at home two days later. This is the last footage Lesko filmed. Live streams we have the Tiki Dandrom, Daitz Ochubi, Chuns operators. Physical to sort the moon and the signal guide is sharp, thirty telephones, the Arabinagar, who has the Arabinagar Pasuhobda. In the days following the event, homophobic posters appeared across Tbilisi with pictures of Georgian Dream's opponents. They bore the slogan, Say No to Evil. Sakashvili was already behind bars. Liberal TV owner Nick Baramia was soon to join him. Another face featured was that of Georgi Tabagari. In my case, when people recognized me and because of that recognition, I ended up in trouble. Lexo's fellow cameramen came out in force to pay tribute to their colleague. <laughs> However, the government claimed Lexo's death was unrelated to his injuries and part of a liberal plot. According to the Prime Minister, this is another failed conspiracy against the state that was masterminded by anti-state and anti-church forces. Not surprisingly, the demonstrations continued. Then, public sentiment soured much further on the 24th of February this year, when Putin's forces invaded Ukraine. To the outrage of many Georgians, the government refused to join much of the rest of the world in imposing sanctions on Russia, and then attempted to block the departure of Georgian volunteers to Ukraine. For years, they've been cultivating the fear of war as an asset and then leverage of their keeping the status quo, saying, if we lose, if we are gone, meaning the oligarch Mr. Venishvili and his team, the Russians will attack us just like in 2008. And now they are using the Ukraine war as an example. Look, that's what's happening if you, if you challenge our status quo here. We are lying low, and that's the way of survival. But laying low is something many Georgians find hard to do. We caught up with David Katsarava and his colleagues in the hills outside Tbilisi. Many of them had already seen action in Ukraine. Some of the estimated 3,000 Georgian volunteers who have gone around the Black Sea to fight against the Russians, one of the biggest foreign contingents in Ukraine's army. In fact, David was amongst the first to liberate Bucha. Well, everybody knows what Russians did there. The way how they were killing uh, them and how they were tortured, torturing them, so it, uh, it's unimaginable. So what lies behind the widespread belief here that Bedzina Ivanishvili is keeping Georgia too closely tied to Russia? Mr. Ivanishvili has uh, many business interests in Russia. He might take particular decisions in the interest of Russia and not uh, Georgian public. People are very much concerned and uh, maybe not all of them know uh, about the particular connections of Ivanishvili uh, with uh, Russian oligarchs. One of these Russian oligarchs is sanctioned billionaire Vladimir Yevtushenkov. In April 2022, a recording of a telephone conversation between the two men emerged, during which Yevtushenkov asks Ivanishvili to join him in a business venture. The two close friends used their nicknames Valod and Berenka. 
Володь, привет. Боренька, привет, родной. Борь, да, да. Есть, есть идея, есть да. идея, которую я хотел бы, там Давид привезет, ну ты видел, Али, зам. Да, 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 да. да. In a follow-up call, Ivanishvili told the Russian he had asked the Prime Minister to help his business associates. He says the Prime Minister will meet your associates. Yes. Like an errand boy. Absolutely, absolutely. And if Tushenkov says, no, I have a serious business, so I want to talk to you, not to some prime minister. What I uh, heard, there was nothing incriminating. It was a friendly conversation between two acquaintances. Yev Tushenkov, seen here with Putin, is an arms manufacturer. His company, Kronstadt, supplies Orion drones to the Russian forces, which are used to bomb Ukrainian cities. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, had already recalled his ambassador to Georgia by the time these phone conversations came to light. But since then, relations have further deteriorated. Of course, it's, it's a shameful behavior by the government, but it's a shame for the whole country and for a long time to come. Back at the border, Russians continue to arrive. To some, a cause for concern. To others, proof that the Kremlin is losing the hearts and minds of Russians at home. Either way, with Putin bogged down in a war he seems less and less likely to win, some believe this is an opportunity for Georgia to finally shake off Russia's overbearing interest. This window of opportunity opened because of the Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine uh, fights our fight as well. And if Ukraine should win the war, what would it mean for Georgia? I think it will weaken uh, the government because government narrative was obviously based on the presumption of uh, Russia winning the war and appeasing Russia uh, and somewhat uh, strengthened the opposition. But though a Russian defeat might loosen Ivanishvili's grip on the country, or even undo Georgia's shackles to Russia, it's worth remembering that the country has had such chances before. Back in 1991, after the fall of the USSR, it won back its independence, but still couldn't fully break free. The most painful thing is the fear of losing another historic momentum and then generations paying price for that, just like it happened in the 90s. In a country where the scars of the Soviet Union are yet to heal, the fear of history repeating itself is palpable. The country is still littered with communist symbols and former Soviet showpiece buildings, many now in ruins like this grand hotel in the spa resort of Skaltubo. Now it's home to refugees from Georgia's two territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, still occupied by Russian troops. Some people have been here for almost 30 years, living proof that the Kremlin's imperial ambitions should never be underestimated. With the sudden influx of so many Russians, there is understandable fear in Georgia of what Putin might do next, whatever happens in Ukraine.